Hi everyone, Joe Kerrig with the Kerrig Real Estate Team. And this is your neighborhood update. And this week we're gonna talk about the Biden presidency and how it is gonna affect real estate. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And please understand that this isn't a political video. Uh, we're not commenting on you know the political side of it. It's only from the standpoint of real estate, how it is gonna affect real estate. And in some of these things, they'll be good and bad, depending on, you know, where you where you come from. And, you know, we'll kind of point that out. But we're just going to deal with it from a real estate standpoint. So so let's talk about the good. Well, one of the and again, just so you guys know, all of these have been proposed or in writing or uh, President Biden has says that he's going to enact the, these. So, you know, again, it might get there. It might not. These are all things that they've been put out there that they say that they're going to do. So um, uh, they're not done as of yet. And certainly, you know, we'll wait and see if, if they do get done. But chances are most of the uh, with control of both Congress and the presidency, I think most of these in some way, shape or form will come across. Number one is one of the things that um, uh, President Biden had talked about was reversing uh uh, Trump's uh, uh, tax cuts because he felt that they benefited the, you know, the the rich and the corporations and such forth like that. Well, one of those things, one of those um, uh, tax uh, things that Trump did was what we call the SALT Act. And the SALT Act was basically state and local taxes. That's what it, that's what it stood for. And if you remember a couple years ago, it did a couple things. It lowered the mortgage deduction from a million to seven fifty, and it basically said you could only write off up to ten thousand dollars of either state or property taxes from your federal taxes. So, in other words, if you live in the San Ramon Valley and you own a house, you're paying more than ten thousand dollars in state taxes. So, in other words, you could not write off your property taxes, and it was a huge blow to the East and the West Coast where people had expensive homes. And it was pushed by the Republicans and the Democrats who got, both voted on it. And, but the re reason the Republicans pushed it is because obviously in this, in this day and age with being trillions of dollars in debt, you have to look for ways to raise money. Well, uh, this was one way of raising money where it was gonna affect the votes because let's face it, politicians look at votes you know, they have lobbyists and they look at, okay, what if I vote here? What's, how's that going to affect my, my vote? So, um, but the East and West Coasts are heavily Democrat, you know, uh, on a national type level. So no matter what you do to the East and West Coast, they're always going to um, uh, vote Democrat uh, overall, not in every individual county, obviously. So the SALT Act really just killed people with expensive homes where you couldn't now write off more than 750000 in, in um, uh, you know, of your mortgage interest. And the little history on that, the National Association of Realtors, when they limited it to a million, we fought really hard for that. Even though there wasn't a lot of people with a million dollar mortgage, especially 20 years ago. But the reason we fought hard for it, not having it, was because we knew that even if they limited it to a million dollars and it wasn't affecting a lot of people, it opened the door to move it down less. And certainly when, when they passed the SALT Act, um, they moved it down to 750. It was actually going to be 500. And it was only at the last day that it got, they compromised between 500 and a million. And it ended up being 750,000. So expect that that's, you know, if they need to raise more money, that's, you know, something that they'll, they'll go back into the, uh, you know, the bucket to do. But, Here's the key to that is with the SALT Act. Now, um, Yellen, who is the, uh, the new chairman of you know, the Federal Reserve, she has basically said, well, you know, wait, not so fast. You know, we're going to take a look at this. And so all of a sudden they were going to repeal it. And now they might end up just repealing the because let's face it, they raised money through the SALT, through, you know, not being able to write off your property taxes, and they raise money other ways. Um, so 
they, you know, they raised money that way so they could obviously cut taxes. Overall, 85% of the people under the SALT Act saved money, you know, got their taxes from Malibu to Manhattan. Most of them saved money on this. Um, it was just on the East and West Coast. So now they're talking about repealing it. But then when they talked about, you know, the property tax end of it, you know, Yellen came out and said, well, wait a minute, you know, not so fast. Let's analyze it as far as the, the taxes. So again, we'll see what happens with that. But it would certainly be good for us if, if they got rid of that. Um, the other thing, which is certainly a good, is uh, 15000 um, uh, down payment assistance for first-time home buyers um, and expanding Section 8 rental assistance. So there's a lot of push uh, from the Biden administration to help first-time home buyers um, Section 8 housing, uh, expanding Section 8 housing uh, assistance. And and again, um, you know, the other side, there is another side that says, hey, if you start giving money away to first-time home buyers, what it's just going to do is continue to increase um, house prices and have a negative effect. But overall, I would say, especially with the first-time uh, home buyer, uh, $15,000 tax credit can definitely be a positive thing. Now, the other thing that, depending on what side of the fence you're on, the good and the bad, uh, President Obama put an affirmative uh, uh, furthering fair housing, at AFFH program. And Trump, a few months ago, recently, you know, backed that off. Now, what that basically said is the fact that you can go into suburban areas and build um, high-density um, housing as long as it had provisions for low and moderately you know, extremely low, moderately low, you know, income housing. Uh, Biden is basically reinstating that. And he also wants to put $640 billion over the next 10 years, you know, towards that. And, but of course, a lot of people are saying, well, where are you getting the $640 billion? Now, when I talk about that being either good or bad, one thing to remember in California, Governor Brown, we already have that. Um, where, you know, as a developer can come in and actually bypass local zoning regulations if 42% are either low or extremely low income. And so, and we're seeing it right now where there's a, a bill being, um, or there's a plan that's been submitted to the city of San Ramon. And if you guys are bill, uh, uh, know where the marketplace uh, shopping center is, uh, where there's, they just did a Trader Joe's, and there's also a Knob Hill. And so the proposal is to knock off the Knob Hill, knock off the Starbucks, that basically half of the shopping center, and to put, I believe it's 284 uh, low, extremely low income housing, five stories high. Um, now, remember, the zoning is just, you can only go a couple stories, and the density is too high. But because of the bill that Governor Brown, regardless of what Biden does, this is already in California. So even though the regulations, the height regulations, you can't go over two stories, the density is too high. As long as a high percentage of the housing is low income or, or extremely low income, um, it is OK. Um, so you will obviously that's why they put it forward. Otherwise, it would never get passed. Um, you know, the, the city of San Ramon cannot sit there and go, no, you can't build five stores, you know, because by the law that Governor Brown put in a few years ago, that's one of the zoning regulations they can bypass. So here's the thing is now some people would consider that good, you know, that, hey, everyone deserves uh, the right to live in San Ramon Danville. Let's face it, it's a great place. So the mindset of, of half the population is the fact that, you know, everyone deserves to live here, whether they work for it or not. So I'm going to talk, and then the other mindset is not in my neighborhood. Um, but I'm just going to talk to you about from the real estate standpoint, forgetting what side of the political spectrum you're on. From the real estate standpoint, even longer than the 43 years I've been professionally selling real estate, there is a rule called the rule of progression or regression. In other words, you'll get sucked up by what's around you or pulled down. So let's say you have a neighborhood of single family homes. And um, 
they're worth a certain value. Let's say the single family homes are worth a million and a half dollars. And then next door, they build some really small single family homes. Well, and let's say they only sell those for a million. Well, what will happen is with the rule of regression, you know, those more expensive homes will get sucked down price wise and the rule of progression, the smaller homes will get sucked up. Hence, you've heard the thing of buying the crappiest home in the nicest neighborhood because you want the rule of progression. You don't want the rule of regression. Um, so, but now let's say next to those smaller single family homes, they put some $500,000 condos. Well, those condos now are gonna pull down those million dollar homes and a million and a half dollar homes. But those condos are gonna get pulled up price-wise by the more expensive around them. Now, let's say next to those condos, they put a five-story apartment complex in there. Well, those condos, single family homes, large single family homes are all gonna get sucked down by the fact that you know, you have a, a five story building where everything else is two stories and it's an apartment complex. So from a real estate standpoint, it's not good. Just from a real estate value standpoint, I'm not making a judgment, a social judgment on whether it's, it's good, bad or indifferent. But so that can be either good or bad, depending on where you come from. From real estate value wise, it's not good. If you live around there, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be good value wise. Number one, it's gonna kind of be an eyesore when you have a five story building and everything else is two stories, um, are at the most three stories. And then also you have a situation where, um, uh, you know, you have apartments um, next to, you know, single family homes and next to uh, condos that are, that are owned. So definitely that uh, um, can be good or bad. Um, the eviction moratorium. Uh, where it was set, uh, Governor Newsom set it up to expire the end of January. He's just extended it to the end of um, June. And what the eviction moratorium basically says, if you're a landlord, and let's say, for instance, your tenant can, because of COVID related, he lost his job for whatever reason, cannot make his payments anymore. If he fills out the paperwork, because you used to be able to give people, as long as you're not in the middle of the lease, you could give people 60 days notice to vacate. And if they didn't vacate, you could evict them. Well, if they fill out the paperwork and can show that it's COVID related on why they can't pay the rent, then they're only obligated to pay that landlord 25% of the rent. As long as they pay 25% of the rent and they prove that it's they're COVID related, that landlord cannot evict them. Um, now, just to understand, that doesn't mean that they don't owe the other 75%. It's not forgiving the other 75%. So if they just pay 25%, then they say, you can go take them to court and go after the 75%, whether you get it or not, that's a, that's a, that's a whole other thing. So um, that's one thing that, you know, can start to get really ugly if you're a landlord, along with a couple other things they're talking about, to the point that I was getting ready to buy another, I own a number of investment properties, and I'll be honest with you, it's it's kind of, I'm, I'm kind of mixed back and forth, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, and then the other thing is, another ugly, when you're talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, is getting rid of 1031 exchanges for people that make above $400,000. Now you might say, okay, I wanna do a 1031 exchange, I don't make above 400,000, but anytime they set something, it's just like, for instance, um, one of the things they're talking about is raising taxes. You know, the personal, or if you make up a 400,000, raising uh, the personal uh, taxes from 37 to 39.6%. Uh, and then from corporate, from 21 to 28%. So when they set those, remember, it's really easy and it happens and no one knows about it. all of a sudden the 400,000, well, they need to raise more money. So it turns to 300,000, then 200,000. And that's obviously what has happened in the past. So when they talk about, okay, we want to eliminate the tax, uh, um, the 1031 exchanges uh, for people making over 400, basically they're kind of saying we're going to, you know, probably eliminate 1031 exchanges which would be brutal if you're an investor and you want to exchange your properties. But here's one of the biggest issues is they're talking about taxing long-term capital gains and qualified dividends 
at or, the ordinary tax rate of 39.6%. You know, they just raised it to 39.6%. Right now, they're saying income's above a million, but the same thing, once they open that door, they're free to, to lower it down. And people go, well, you know, I don't make a million dollars. Well, if you sold a piece of property and you weren't able to take your long-term capital gains at 20% and you had to tax it at 39%, that might push you into a higher tax bracket. Certainly probably going to push you over 400000 and potentially could, um, uh, you know, push you above the million threshold. And again, that $400 million is arbitrary and they can, they can uh, um, open it up. So... The ugly, if you're an investor and you're a landlord, it's it's downright ugly what they're talking about doing. But I told you, there's a contrary for me. I, I'm, I'm kind of split on it because the one thing that they fully expect and they think that might happen is hyperinflation. Well, hi, when hyperinflation happens, the dollar's worth nothing. So let's say, for instance, you have... 500,000 equity in a real, real estate and you go, hey, I'm going to sell it Why I can and pay and get long-term capital gains and you put the 500,000 in the bank. Well, then if hyperinflation kicks in, then you have a situation where now you, um, uh, you know, the, the money in the bank, the dollars in the bank become, I'm not going to say worthless, but they go down in value. But one of the best hedges against inflation is real estate. So I'm on the mode where I'm just kind of sitting back. I'm not buying anything right now. I'm watching it, but I'm not selling anything either because I know real estate's the best hedge against inflation. So if you have any questions, again, I'm not a CPA. First thing I want to tell you is all of these things, 90% of them are proposed. So don't make any moves based on this. Sit down with your CPA. Um, your accountant, your financial advisor, and get the up-to-date information because God knows, you know, it's changing every day now as as President Biden, um, uh, you know, uh, has an opportunity to sit down and start signing the bill. So these things are going to change. And even stuff they propose, I think, is going to come out maybe differently, like they're talking about the SALT Act. You know, yeah, that was going to be repealed. We're going to be able to write off our property taxes. And then Yellen sits there and goes, well, well, wait, 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 you know, wait a minute, that's making us more money. Do we really want to do that? So again, but if you want to sit down and talk about your individual situation, you should talk to your CPA, accountant, financial person, but also you should talk to your real estate person. So if you have any questions on that, especially, you know, we're well-versed um, on 1031 exchanges, investments. I have own a number of investment properties on a number of exchanges. Give me a call. Again, Joe Kerrig, 925-487-487. 6838. Again, 925-487-6838. Or reach out to joe at kerrigteam.com. Joe at k-e-h-r-i-g-t-e-a-m.com. And if you like these videos, please tap the like button and hit the subscribe button. And click on the bell and you'll receive alerts on new videos. You know, thanks again. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, have a great 2021. Please be safe and may God bless you. May God bless your family and may God bless the United States of America.